Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Lance Chen of Digital Transitions. And I just wanted to thank you for coming to our Project Lemonade webinar series, stopping by here. Uh, the staff here at DT hope you're all faring well during uh, the situation that we're all experiencing. We started Project Lemonade series of webinars to keep in touch with the photographic community during these trying times. What you'll experience today during our webinar is an example of one of the ways we interface with our clients and community. Um, I'm going to start with uh, an Adam Elstein, who's pictured beside me to my right, will be our feature presenter and give us an overview on tech cameras. Um, first, I have a couple slides just to uh, explain to you who Digital Transitions is in case you're not familiar with us. First slide obviously has pictures of what tech cameras look like. Um, I've already introduced Adam Elstein, our presenter. Uh, I'm Lance Shad. Joe King is our, our support manager. He'll be monitoring the chat along with Arnob Chatterjee, who's one of our technical specialists as well. He'll be joining us. And uh, special thanks to Kate Stone, our events manager, for pulling this all together. Digital transitions, who are we? We are a company that specializes in um, high-end uh, digital imaging solutions. We have three different business units. One is the commercial photo side of things, which covers general uh, medium format uh, photography needs uh, based around the phase one platform. Along with that, we have our cultural heritage division in which we specialize in providing solutions for museums, libraries, cultural institutions all across the world. Um, with the highest quality um, systems and for reprographic uh, reproductions of their their objects. And then we also just um, acquired Pixel Acuity, which is our service bureau end of things, that uh, services the cultural heritage community, along with other um, places that may need high-end digitization completed. Um, we have a team of over 20 people located in offices in both New York and LA and all across the United States as well. Um, our web resources uh, are available at digitaltransitions.com and then you go to DT Commercial Photo. And here are a few that we will be uh, referencing today. Uh, one is our main page. The next would be our tech camera resource. Uh, we do have an online store for all your needs. Uh, and then also some technical tools, such as our lens visualizer, which Adam will cover in the presentation in a little bit. Um, we also have two other websites that are specifically uh, resources for the Phase 1 XT technical camera, uh, which we'll be showcasing during this uh, presentation as well. And then one also on the Phase 1 IQ4 all the features and uh, benefits and technical specs on that camera system, the digital back that Adam uses. Um, ways to learn more, our websites. We also offer web-based remote demonstrations. So, you know, during these times where you can't make it out to one of our offices for an in-person demonstration, we can set up a one-on-one -on -one webinar. And then we also have a whole rental division where you can try the equipment out before you might want to make an investment in it. Here are some of the social media uh, tags that we have set up for today and that our company is represented at. And then Adam Elstein is up next with his presentation about technical cameras. Adam is an architectural photographer and educator. Uh, he's a professor at Pratt Institute and leads workshops across the country, including at the Santa Fe uh, photo workshops. Um, his work has won numerous awards and has been exhibited internationally. Um, so without further ado, I am going to pass this along to Adam. Also, one more thing, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and one of our moderators will uh, get it over to Adam or myself or Arnob and get it answered for you. So thank you. Great. Um, can everybody hear me, first of all? Just want to be sure that it's all, it's all clear. OK, beautiful, fantastic. Well, um, I will be switching to my presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, 
uh, in, a, in a minute or two. But I just wanted to say um, hello and um, welcome from, from Brooklyn, New York, Dumbo. Um, thank you so much um, to Lance, uh, to Kate, to all the amazing people at Digital Transitions who have been incredibly supportive to me over the years. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for tuning in. It, it's, uh, I think it's a really great thing to do while we're all sort of, uh, sort of shut in. Um, it's a great time to kind of go deep. Uh, and I'm really happy uh, to be able to be giving this presentation. So I'll talk a little bit about what I'm going to do, a little bit about who I am and what I'm going to do, and then I'll just do it. So I am a photographer. I'm an architecture photographer. It's my, my sort of main profession, or I would say my half profession, because when I'm not shooting commercially and working on my fine art projects, um, I'm a professor um, in the architecture department at Pratt Institute um, here in Brooklyn, where I've been teaching for the past 15 or 16 years uh, everything from uh, design um, to architectural photography uh, to architectural visualization. So what you're going to be seeing is, is a kind of um, mashup, in a sense, uh, of things that I've done, particularly for digital transitions. We did a talk, talk at Photo Plus last fall. Um, uh, and also a little bit about, uh, in general, about architectural photography and about um, ideas of perspective and ideas of composition. Um, uh, because this is how I think about things. And the general idea of this talk is to kind of explain what I believe the sort of amazing uh, advantages are to using tech cameras. I've been using them now for many, many years. And I started, you know, my photographic practice on, you know, like many people did in the architectural world, on, you know, sort of four by five film and I've used every possible system with movements. Uh, but the tech camera is really the best discuss a little bit about what you can do with it um, and uh, and why. Um, so I'm going to put the questions on here, number one. None of them have flagged yet. And I'm going to try to now go to my notation. Uh, hang on one second here. OK, hang on. Let me just uh, make sure. OK. Uh, here. Can people see me now? Hello? Anyone want to make okay. you a little smaller to make the presentation larger? In the upper right-hand corner of the screen, next to where the picture of Adam is, there's a plus and minus, a minus sign. You can minus it, and it makes his picture smaller and the presentation larger. Okay, great. Uh, I guess I'm I'm on now. Uh, for some reason, I'm on the question. Oh, now I see. Okay, I, now I see the uh, the regular chat. Okay, fantastic. Great. So now that everybody can see the presentation, I will begin. So um, uh, I call the presentation "Technical Camera Craft 101." Um, and the important thing about technical cameras, although the name sounds uh, scary, perhaps technical camera. What's so technical about it? Um, I would actually call the technical camera. Um, a kind of an art camera or a craft camera. So we go to the sort of original, sort of ancient Greek definition of techne, meaning art or skill. Um, uh, a techne is, is basically a principle or method employed in making something or attaining an objective. So in, in this case, what I think a technical camera is really fantastic for um, is precise control of composition. So that's what I'm gonna really be talking about. Um, the kinds of technical cameras uh, that uh, Phase one and Campbell offer um, are uh, are basically, I think, for, for my purposes, the, the best in the market, particularly the Phase one XT. Um, I do not have uh, an XT with me, but um, Arnab from Digital Transitions does. Uh, so uh, at some point, I'm actually going to be calling upon him uh, to share the screen uh, and share it uh, physically. Uh, but basically, the advantages of the system um, that I'm going to be discussing are the fact that we have what are known as movements, which is the ability, I'll, I'll try to explain that in some detail, what a movement is and why it's important. So in the um, earlier Campbell systems, um, we have movements, and in the new Phase One XT, which is amazing, um, we have movements and what I would call positional intelligence, uh, which is the ability to really fully understand um, how the, uh, the camera is being oriented and how the lens is being aimed. Um, and also one of the things that we also have, which I don't have here, um, uh, uh, is leaf shutters, which are which are also um, amazing. Um, so 
Here, I'm gonna, let me just, um, I'm gonna take a step back. You have to understand, I am a professor, so I apologize if I'm gonna be a little professorial about it. Uh, but I wanna start out with this quote, which I really like. Um, it's a book by John McPhee about Bill Bradley, who's the senator um, who he played basketball at Princeton. And I love this story about Bill Bradley um, uh, when McPhee met him when he was, a, he was I guess, a, in college. Um, he saw Bradley practicing and how Bradley could basically uh, sink the shot uh, by throwing the ball over his shoulder. Um, and the reason that I, I love this quote, to me, and I always thought about it when I think about photography, is you have to develop a sense of where you are. In architectural photography, any kind of photography I think of, um, of spaces and places, um, you have to develop a sense of what you are in particular. You have to understand where your camera is and the position of your camera relative to the object, because that controls pretty much everything. Um, so uh, a, a quote that I took from another book I read a long time ago, which I really like is, you know, your targets dictate your tools, your tools dictate your movement. Um, in my opinion, if you can't get there, you can't make the picture. So one of the most amazing things I think about tech cams, um, and particularly about the, the XT system, um, is this is an incredibly elegant, small and portable system um, that really can give you the same results as, you know, I certainly was able to get on 4 by 5 film, possibly even 8 by 10 film um, in the day. So this is a system that gives you um, kind of extreme movement, which I love. Um, I always have two boring slides in my presentation, and maybe more than two, but this is one of the most boring slides. Just to understand where I want to go. All photography involves transforming three dimensions into two, right? We're projecting the real world uh, from three dimensions onto two. So the orientation of the plane that captures uh, the image uh, determines what the embedded perspective is in the image. And that's kind of an important thing. This is the second boring slide, but it's very, very important to understand. Um, the creation of perspective and the correction of perspective are not the same thing. What do I mean? People will say, okay, well, why do I need these systems? Because I can always correct it in Photoshop. Um, not entirely true. Um, you can certainly correct a lot in Photoshop, but the original image, the original perspective, what you actually see um, is determined by the position of the camera. It's determined specifically by the height of the camera, by the tilt of the camera. It's determined by the lens focal length. And of course, it's determined by how you frame the shot. Um, and that's really what I want to talk about here and why movements in particular are very, very important. And I'll describe my sort of workflow in general. Um, perspective can be corrected with camera movements. It can also be, let's say, somewhat corrected in post-processing, but it can't be changed in post-processing. I mean, I would say in general, camera movements are cleaner, um, they maintain uh, pr correct proportionality, and they're less destructive. Um, so I am always trying to do what I can in camera, uh, but there's always, of course, a post-processing, and I understand that um, uh, Jeff Totaro will be going through his own architectural photography workflow uh, later next week, um, and I'm super looking forward to seeing that. Okay, so, a, three, a few key terms to understand um, how I think about perspective. This is sort of the stuff that I teach to my Pratt students. Um, the three key terms are the focal axis, which is the relationship, the axis between uh, the camera and uh, the object that you're shooting. The primary massing, which is what you're shooting. In this case, it's, it's the, that's called the big cube. Um, and uh, the green face in particular is the facade of the building. And then there's tilt, the degree to which the lens uh, is focused, let's say, directly or parallel to the ground or to which it's, it's looking up or looking down. Okay, already got that. Um, what I want to try to explain to you is how these parameters control the type of perspective that are produced in a shot. So well, I'm going to define this in a second, uh, what a one-point perspective is. Uh, for those of you who have ever taken any you know, basic photography or art classes, uh, it's a particular perspective type. The rules of a one-point perspective is that the focal axis should be perpendicular exactly to the primary mass. Okay? Um, a two-point perspective is created when we're not perpendicular, when we're slightly oblique to the primary massing. So let's have a look and see what these things look like, and then I'll go into it a little bit more detail so you can understand. Um, when we're a one-point perspective uh, means that um, our verticals are vertical. Uh, it means that our horizontals are perfectly horizontal. Um, but without tilting, that also means that our composition may not be what we want it to be. That's where movements come in. Uh, so you can see the one-point perspective on the left. 
Um, the two-point perspective, uh, our verticals are vertical, but our horizontals are not. As a matter of fact, our horizontals um, uh, are actually uh, tilted and they create lines of convergence. They actually create these kind of virtual lines that converge on the horizon uh, at places which are known as vanishing points. Um, and the three-point perspective is on the right. This is when the camera is actually tilted up. So for architectural purposes, most architectural renderings involve either one or two-point perspective, and that's what I'm going to really focus on um, today. So I just want to say, in my opinion, um, how I teach, kind of composition uh, is design, and design is composition. So what does that mean? The questions that I'm always asking myself, that I'm asking my students when I evaluate their work, my work, um, is how does composition activate the energy within the frame? So what is the frame? How do we control the frame? How does it engage an idea or narrative? How does it apply contrast? And how does it exploit color? Today, I'm really going to be talking about framing. Framing is the territory of the image. So technical cameras are superb devices for controlling how we frame. And that's what I want to discuss. Let me talk a little bit more about uh, the perspective types so you understand. Here's a quick diagram that I, that I uh, drew last uh, fall about a one-point perspective. So one-point perspective, again, is when we are perpendicular to the primary massing um, and the camera is level. So we get this sense of space receding and all lines converge at a single point. Let's look at a few photographs uh, that actually embed this perspective. These are sort of classics, shall we say. Ezra Stoller, who was one of the, one of the greats. This is just an image that I happened to pull um, Seagram Building in 1958, One Point Perspective. Beinecke Library at Yale, 1963. Again, a One Point Perspective. These were created by being very, very precise about the placement of the camera vis-a-vis -vis the facade um, or the plane that it is facing, okay? Two Point Perspective. Um, two Point Perspective uh, is a situation where we are no longer perpendicular to the primary facade. We're at an angle. In this case, let's say it's almost like a 45 degree angle to this, uh, let's say the front uh, mass or building. Um, and what happens here is that our verticals are vertical because our camera is, is, is level, but we get, car, um, we get uh, vanishing points uh, to the right and the left. So this is the sort of second traditional form, shall we say, uh, of architectural rendering. Um, images, you know, which kind of display two point perspectives, classic shot of the Seagram's building, 1958. Again, um, Ezra Stoller. Uh, it's very clear if you see that the verticals are vertical, and if you trace the lines uh, that are horizontal, they will converge on the horizon, which we can't even see here. Um, another image, classic, that doesn't isn't quite perhaps as apparently a two-point perspective, but most definitely is, um, is this case study uh, 22 um, by Julius Shulman, probably one of the most iconic architectural images ever created. Um, so. So that's basically uh, the, the, the main principles of placement of camera. And I'm gonna go over that more when we look at examples, et cetera. Um, I wanna talk a few, uh, I wanna say a few words also about principles of composition. Um, you know, we talk uh, to a certain extent about um, the rule of thirds. I think this is a rule which, you know, to a certain, I would certainly say is, is made to be broken in general. There are no such thing as rules in photography. And yet I would say within architectural photography, um, the rules are, are maybe more useful um, than you might think. So these are sort of my twist on certain of the rules. Um, the work that I see, and I'm gonna go through a lot of examples, um, one you know, strategy that, that's important in composition with the rule of thirds um, is to think about placement of the horizon line. So one strategy, for example, a typical strategy might be to have your camera level, to place the camera, uh, the horizon line on the lower third. You would need movements in order to achieve this generally, or a lot of cropping. Um, so another compositional strategy, um, which we'll see in some fine art photography, would be to place the horizon line on the upper third. This tells a different story. So in this case, this is actually a two-point perspective, but from a higher point of view with less sky. Um, sort of formulaic, but I think they're actually very useful formulas. Um, we might use the rule of thirds, for example, to place a vanishing point on a grid intersection. In other words, we're basically guiding the viewer's eye um, and using this kind of rule of thirds proportionality to decide where the uh, eye is guided to. Um, or for example, another strategy might be um, to use a very, very low horizon line to emphasize um, the, the position of the building or the complex you know, in space. That's something uh, 
which um, I do a lot depending on, on where I happen to be shooting. So these are just sort of stra um, strategic ideas and schemes for composition. Um, yeah, the rules definitely, somebody said the rules are there to be adapted, not broken. I would absolutely agree. Sorry, I'm trying not to look at the chat, but I, I, I absolutely agree with, with what that person just said. Um, in any case, how do you actually do it? Um, in order to embed and, and embody these rules um, and break them or adapt them, um, you have to have a system. You have to have a well thought out system. And, and quite frankly, um, having the right equipment, in my opinion and experience, makes a huge difference. So to me, the key components of the system are number one, the tripod that you use. Um, that obviously controls the camera height, and there are a lot of options there. Um, number two um, is the, uh, the head um, that you use on your tripod. Um, and I'm a big fan of three axis heads. Um, the Arca Cube is, has been my go-to for, for many years um, and has really, uh, I would say, changed my work when I first got this uh, 11 or 12 years ago, 13 years ago, whatever. And of course, the, the technical body, uh, which we um, can talk about. Uh, so the system um, is really key. Probably the, uh, the other thing that I don't show here uh, in my system uh, is actually the portable uh, stool that I bring with me uh, because I think it takes time. Uh, I'm very tall. So I like to take and take my time and sit. So this, this is a, a process that records a, uh, that, that rewards a certain amount of precision. So I actually do the unshown item in my toolkit is actually my, my little folding stool. Um, so these are the, um, the, the cameras um, that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I think at, at this point, what would really be useful is if I could call upon Arnob um, to jump in um, and just to show the phase one XT um, and to demonstrate uh, what I'm talking about uh, with uh, movement, just technically, so you understand what that means. What it means basically is the ability um, to shift the plane of the sensitive surface, i.e. Uh, the back or the film surface, relative to the lens. Uh, and I'll be giving more discussion about what that actually means, but I'd like or not to show it. Adam, uh, sure thing. Let me... Uh, I'm going to ask if you could stop sharing uh, and okay. turn off your camera just so we get the full okay. screen. Understood. Um, let, me, let me try to do that. I'm stop, stopping my sharing and I'm turning my Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to pop in here real quick. This is the Phase 1 XT, one of the technical cameras that Adam was talking about. And you can see that I, with the digital back on here, I have my... Um, knobs here that I can use to move the digital back relative to the rest of the camera without adjusting anything else. And so I can move it along the y-axis up and down or along the x-axis left and right. Can you show um, Arnab uh, also how you can reorient the position from um, uh, landscape to uh, uh, portrait. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of technical cameras will have this feature. They'll have some sort of lock that will allow you to rotate the camera from a portrait to a landscape mode and vice versa. And uh, you'll notice that the lens itself maintains the same location in space. And that's, that's important for keeping the same yeah. position. Absolutely. Um, so you can hear me now, by the way, you can hear my voice. Can you, you can hear me? No, not great. I just want to say, can you turn um, turn the camera so that it's sort of in profile, so people can see it in profile? Yeah, and one thing I just wanted to say that's very important to understand about this system um, and how this differs from, let's say, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, tilt shift lenses of the sort that might be used, um, uh, you know, with a, with a DSLR type back or a mirrorless back. Um, a, a crucial difference is the fact as Arnav mentioned, um, the lens in this system stays in exactly the same point um, without, uh, despite how you move the back. That's very important um, because that allows uh, parallax-free uh, stitching if necessary. Um, it allows the composition to remain um, sort of, you know, perfect without uh, changing it. If, it. if you were to move the front of the lens, that would introduce certain artifacts, particularly because effectively you're changing the the actual image. Um, uh, so the fact that this 
the back can be moved um, freely and the X and the Y um, is, is important. Um, it should be noted on the XT, you've got about 12 millimeters of movement, um, uh, but, um, you, uh, but, but I think you know, 12 millimeters is basically good for about, I would say about 95% of use cases. Um, I mean, yeah, if you, if you do, yeah, if you rotate 90%, uh, 90 degrees, um, you effectively are sampling the same image plane if you think about it. Um, but sure, when you shift, you're shifting, um, your, your composition is shifting because you're, uh, instead of, um, you're grabbing more, shall we say, on the bottom of the frame if you're in portrait uh, than you are if you're in landscape. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the more, the more movements, the better. Um, and I would say, it, you know, it's to some extent a limitation, the fact that you've got 12 millimeters. In the beginning, I thought it was more of a limitation uh, than I do now. Um, uh, and I, I actually think that, um, uh, truthfully, the trade-off between um, the positional intelligence, the leaf shutter, uh, I feel I'm getting a lot more with the XT than I'm, than I'm get, giving up um, in that case. Uh, but in any case, it's, it's important for you to know. So I, maybe I should jump back. Can I jump back to the, um, okay, so I'm going to turn my webcam back on and I'm going to presentation again here. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop off now. So let me know if you need okay. anything else. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take myself yeah. off. Yeah, good. Yeah, it is, it is important to know. Somebody just uh, popped up in the chat. Um, I would say you know the the engineers at Phase One are are I mean they obviously know what they're doing. Um, when you do get when you do push uh, the cameras to extremes, obviously you get some degree of um, image degradation at the very far extremes. So 12 millimeters also keeps you well within the image circle, which we'll talk about, which is great. Um, okay, so here, let's keep going. Um, I'm gonna, now this is hopefully gonna be sort of the fun part and I'll go quickly through. I wanna show some inspirations and I wanna show the kind of work that can be made with these devices. Um, I'll show some inspirations from work that inspires me um, and then I'll show some of my own work and then I'll come back to some of the technical issues um, and uh, then we'll wrap it and ask for questions. So inspirations. Um, I'm a, a photographer who um, loves uh, catalogs, typologies. Um, I love sort of the use of photography um, to repeat uh, sort of images of different things sort of in the same way. So um, uh, the Beckers for me are a huge uh, influence. Uh, you know, their work on industrial typology in Germany, um, the entire Dusseldorf school is very, very important. And clearly there's a formality here uh, that I love, and this is the kind of work you really need these tools to make. Um, other examples, Ken Behofer, who was um, also part of the Dusseldorf School, um, amazing uh, work uh, using, you know, the sort of the technique of the one point. These are, by the way, shot, these are huge, huge images, and it does them no justice whatsoever to be showing them in the, the space of a slideshow. Um, other incredible one points by, by Hoffer. Um, I love the work of Thomas Struth. They're not strictly speaking one points, but you know they, they tell stories um, and are probably sort of two points. Uh, but again, a certain formality. Um, Gursky um, is uh, a photographer whose work, you know, almost has a kind of surrealism um, in its its precision and its scale. Um, you know, this is this is work that Gursky's done. Uh, and again, it's, if you notice, you know, there's a there's an incredible precision uh, precision in terms of um, verticals and horizontals. So the craft, the techne in this image, I think is super important. Other work by Gursky, you know, sort of showing in a sense the surreal quality of the world, which is something that I'm interested in. Uh, this is one of my very favorite images ever. Talk about low um, uh, horizon lines. This is of a nuclear reactor in Japan, Kamiokande. This is a huge thing. If you notice down here at the lower right-hand corner, you can see as a scale figure, uh, someone in a small, um, uh, like a little canoe. So Gursky's work is super inspirational to me. Robert Polidori, I'm interested in the formal, but also the informal. Pa Polidori, who also worked, um, you know, uh, with, um, you know, a sort of precise technical craft. This is work that he made uh, when he was uh, working as an art handler. Uh, I believe this was in, in France. I'm not sure exactly where, um, in Versailles, I believe. Uh, this work is incredible. Again, the scale is not really done justice. Um, I'm super interested in terms of my own personal work in, in the informal and the sort of the found condition. Uh, Paul Lurie's work um, in, in Cuba to the left, his work in Chernobyl um, uh, is, um, uh, is also super inspirational to me. 
Uh, and again, um, you know, you have to be able to get to these places. Um, and you have to, you know, I don't know how Paul had already managed to get his large format stuff down to Cuba, and I really applaud him for doing that, or to Chernobyl, uh, but these days with the tech camera, I think it's just really that much easier. Um, other work that I just think has incredible uh, sort of formality. Oh, I love I love that work, by the way, of, of Camilo Jose Vergara. I don't know if his name. It's been inspirational to me for a long time. Uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, Bertinsky, uh, again, um, you know, Bertinsky's work, we know Bertinsky as probably one of the um, uh, one of the leading, if not our leading landscape photographer today. Uh, but And I love Bertinsky's landscape work. It's incredible and inspirational. I also love, you know, the work that Bertinsky has done of, um, let's say, industrial spaces in form. And again, just to just sort of note the formality of these images, Bertinsky is an incredible, incredible craftsman. He also uses perspective to tell stories. Um, these are just two images. Again, these would be huge, um, you know, uh, from work that he's done in China. You know, the usage of the one-point perspective, I think, is really, really powerful um, in storytelling. Um, looking at work made by contemporary masters, um, I, I feel like I really want to show the work of um, Nick Merrick, uh, who is my teacher, uh, my mentor, and a, and, a, and a good friend of mine. Um, Nick is, I think, one of the most incredible um, contemporary architectural photographers, um, and his work is, is just beautiful. Again, everything is very, very carefully considered. Nick himself is, is, a, is a user of, of, um, uh, uh, of cameras with movements, shall we say. I'm not sure he's a tech camera user, but he's, a, he's an Arca-Swiss um, user. And a, so his work, again, I think if you analyze these work, this work, you will see it's usually a two point, it's probably one point on the left, two point on the right, uh, but an incredible amount of subtlety. But the, the form and the shape of the image, or let's say the, the logic of the image, um, comes through. So despite the fact that there's a lot going on, um, uh, it's all kept logical uh, by the imposition of certain disciplined uh, sort of forms. I think that's important. Other work, incredible work uh, by Nick. This is with sort of wide, sort of super wide angle stuff that he does. Um, I love the work of Helene Binet, who works um, uh, on a film camera. Uh, she is um, uh, a photographer who I think whose work really kind of uh, sort of hovers between the abstract and the, and the real. Um, I love this is work that she did of uh, Peter Zotor's baths in, um, in Switzerland. Um, I love the fact that Ellen Binet is also doesn't always adhere to the rules. Sometimes there are times to break the rules. In this case, these are tilt-up. These are images that are about light, uh, particularly one on the left, um, Corbusier's Firmini Church. Incredible work, and these are all, you know, very large format images. Um, Helen Binet knows how to tell a story, and she knows when to tilt the camera. This is uh, the Maxi Center, um, Zaha Hadid's work down in Rome. Again, um, this does not, um, let's say, respect formal principles, but it tells a story, so who cares, really? Um, other work that I just think is incredible that has formal properties, um, I'll point it out if you don't know the work of Sei Chong Song Long. Oops, my, my cat, my, uh, Sei Chong Long, uh, probably not pronouncing his name correctly, um, who is, I know, trained as an architect, who's a fine art photographer. Um, this is a, pro, a project that he's done. Um, again, this is from very, very high format, uh, large, large format film, uh, where he traveled the world um, and basically made the same picture um, of, uh, uh, of, of cities um, from sort of similar vantage points all over the world. So these are all very, very large format images. I format as you see, so you get the idea. Again, the strategy of where do you place the horizon um, and how can it be done uh, to create a body of work? Um, I think this work is really stunning. Um, again, just throwing in stuff, again, breaking the rules. I'm personally influenced uh, by um, the artist, um, I guess you could call him a photographer, permanent artist, Ed Ruscha, whose work is completely informal. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, this is um, on the top, this is a, a sort of a, a early kind of photo books that he did. Some LA apartments down underneath it is an iconic book called Every Building on the Sunset Strip. So, you know, there's a time for formality and a time for not formality. Um, sometimes, for example, you'll see here's work by Hiroshi Sugimoto, which is very, very formal, um, and yet, on the other hand, informal in the sense that Sugimoto has played with defocusing as a way of trying to understand, you know, what is the iconic nature of these iconic buildings. Um, so this is, you know, obviously the Guggenheim on the right and on the uh, on the left and on the right. If I don't know if anybody recognizes that, but that's the uh, the UN General Assembly building. 
Uh, so Sugimoto, again, the idea is, is I think, the most important thing. Uh, and finally, a photographer whose work I absolutely love, you know, who doesn't use a tech camera, but whose work is, um, you know, it's interesting, I'll, I'll make the point in a second, uh, Todd Hedo. Uh, Todd Hedo, you know, who said, you know, he shoots like a documentarian, but he prints uh, like a painter. Um, you know, Todd Hedo's work, uh, you know, is not um, uh, uh, observing the formal rules, and yet, um, you know, clearly he captures something. Um, and and you, one could say there are definitely are times to break or relax the rules. Uh, this is part of um, uh, his house hunting series uh, and also foreclosed. Um, it's interesting uh, that when Todd Hito shoots commercial assignments, incidentally, um, he does go back to the rules, so to speak. Uh, these are two images from commercial assignments that Todd Hito shot for Dwell. And you will notice, if you look at this, that um, in the commercial work that Todd Hito does, um, he is actually uh, observing these rules of vertical verticals and um, uh, horizontal horizontals. Okay, a, a few um, images for myself, my own personal work. So I'm a New York City photographer. Um, uh, I've lived here for a long time. I love the city, so you know my personal work um, is based uh, here. Um, uh, I also teach um, uh, in um, uh, in Santa Fe, as Lance noted. Um, we uh, we're planning uh, a, a seminar um, here in New York, which uh, will hopefully be rescheduled for the fall. This is work um, that I did as actually as part of my seminar class um, in Santa Fe. This is um, uh, a Masonic uh, temple there. So um, this, I'm gonna show you a little combination of some personal work, just kind of almost random. Uh, okay, so um, I see Al Simmons. Uh, the work that I'm showing now is actually a hybrid. There'll be a lot of it that's made uh, with the phase one system. Uh, some of it has been made um, on uh, Sony mirrorless cameras as well. Uh, a lot of different things over the years. So I'll just go quickly. Um, uh, I'm interested, like all you know, architectural photographers, how do we tell stories? Um, uh, how do we use people? Um, how can we use different, uh, you know, um, perspectival types to highlight details, um, etc. So this is just a sort of an uh, assortment of what I do on my day to day. Um, some personal stuff, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to travel to Cuba. I have a kind of personal project where I've been, you know, doing work documenting the sort of forgotten modernism. There's some, uh, there's a, in Cuba, they're very, very good at preserving their, uh, uh, their uh, colonial architecture. Uh, they're not as good as preserving their modernism. So uh, when I go to Cuba and I've been several times, I'm really interested in finding these kind of amazing projects from the 50s and 60s that in many cases have sort of fallen into disuse. And of course, Cuba, for those of you who know, Lance has been there many times, um, is just a kind of an amazing um, uh, location for all kinds of photographic things, but particularly for architecture, actually. Um, it's maybe under, under, underestimated as a site for architectural photography um, as well. So this is kind of work that I do uh, there as part of a kind of personal work. Um, uh, so I, I, I spent a lot of time traveling to places uh, for my personal work uh, where they're sort of lost or forgotten. I think of them as kind of lost worlds. Uh, this, by the way, I don't know, Lance, I ever showed you this image. Uh, you lent, lent me an achromatic back uh, a couple years back. This is actually a Mare Island, which is um, an abandoned uh, nuclear uh, uh, submarine station out in Vallejo, California. Uh, this is actually um, uh, uh, a Coast Guard uh, residence that a friend of mine used to actually live in, believe it or not. Um, uh, and so my work, um, sort of takes the form, my personal work takes the form of um, projects. One of my big projects over the years has been documenting a city of um, abandoned grain silos up in Buffalo, New York. Um, uh, it's known sometimes as Elevator Isla, Island or Silo City. I was really intrigued to discover that this place um, uh, was actually, these actual buildings were the inspirations for, for um, a lot of architectural modernism. Walter Gropius, Le Corbusier, et cetera, were sort of captivated by images of this place um, uh, in the uh, early 20th century. Um, and these forms actually inspired a lot of what they did. Uh, when I discovered that, both as an architect and somebody um, who's from the region, uh, I was super excited uh, to get in and to do my own personal take. Uh, in this case, a lot of this stuff is, um, is shot uh, in uh, infrared, because for me, there was a dreamlike quality that I, that I was interested in, in sort of capturing. Uh, so the work you know, is, is about the buildings, um, it's to a certain extent about landscape. Um, it's about the kind of the visual chess problems I, I used to think of them as um, and the sort of the interiors. 
Um, I had this place to myself for days and days and days and weeks, which was amazing to be able to wander around inside this lost city um, to discover the details of, of what was there. Um, this was work that I did probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, uh, and yeah, to be able to find this kind of almost like lost or found um, collages. I'm, I'm really interested in, in sort of detritus and, and, and trash in my personal work uh, and what I can sort of uh, pull out of it. Uh, so I'm also interested um, in uh, abstraction. Um, I uh, frequently will find myself after I do a job uh, wandering around um, and shooting for myself. Uh, and so this is work in a sense where I, I'm not tethered uh, to the constraints um, of uh, the technical camera, but it's work that's meaningful to me. This is, this is stuff that I did after a project I shot years ago in um, uh, the San Francisco MoMA before it was actually um, uh, uh, renovated. And um, this was uh, probably my first, um, uh, my fir one of my first sort of big awards I got for this project was how do we abstract the space? This is um, Mario Bota, who's a Swiss architect whose work I, I, I really admire. Um, and this photography is, again, in certain ways about flattening the space, um, understanding maybe form as, 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 as kind, of, kind of flat space. It's really influenced also by a photographer whose work I love, named, whose name is uh, Judith Turner. Um, anyway, uh, other stuff that I do, you know, getting back to getting to the back of the beyond, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really deeply fascinated by California um, and by places in California that are kind of on the edge. Um, I started about six or seven years ago traveling to California, driving up and down, particularly during the moments of drought. Um, and I, I found myself specifically fascinated uh, by um, the Salton Sea um, and by the forms of dwelling that I found around the Salton Sea. Uh, so I call the project sort of the Accidental Sea because the Salton Sea was actually created by accident, strangely enough. Um, so this is work that I've, that I've made. Uh, this is work, incidentally, I just wanted to say, this stuff is actually shot on the IQ 150 um, with the tech, um, with the, using the tech system. Um, and I, I just wanted to shout out to Lance. I remember when I was making this work, and I don't know if Lance remembers, I was so utterly overjoyed with the quality of what I was able to produce that I, I sent Lance an email the first night I got back and I said, I just feel really blessed that I have the equipment that can, that can make these kind of images because I see this in my mind um, and I can actually sort of capture it. Um, the image of the right. Totally though. Yeah, remember that? Yeah, yeah no, I was, I, was, I, was, I was really like, I was really moved. Um, the image on the right incidentally is, is from an area called um, uh, Slab City. Uh, it's actually, that's where people squat. It's one of the last available squatting lands um, in California that's free. And I have a whole series of work where people have actually broken camp. So it's about kind of like uh, squatting and breaking camp. Um, in any case, uh, yeah, I mean, dwelling dwelling on the edge, in a sense, is one of my themes. Um, uh, and, and these are images, again, this is also, I think this was literally the night I came back and I was like, oh my God, I'm shooting at night. I'm making images that are basically noise free with complete control. And I'm able to work the way that I work um, because, you know, I don't ask for permission when I do what I do, which means I have to be able to work very, very quickly in front of somebody's house. I've gotten to the point where I can go and make my composition and be out of there in under a minute. I mean, literally exposure time with basically maybe 20 seconds to set up. Um, and, and I could not do that without the, the tools that I have. So I really want to take my hat off to phase one and Campbell for doing this. Um, this is, these are images of made of small houses um, in uh, Bombay Beach, uh, which is um, uh, literally the lowest community uh, in California. It's on the um, edge of the Salton Sea. Um, absolutely, nothing beats the danger of a quick te technical shot. That's very true. Um, uh, and um, yeah, especially when, you're, um, when it's two o'clock in the morning um, and you're in the middle of the desert uh, and you have no idea who's gonna be coming around the corner. Uh, which is how I made um, these shots. As they say, it's always easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, other stuff um, uh, that I will go through very, very quickly. Um, this is my last project that I'm going to show. Uh, I, um, uh, this is the flip side of the California sort of desert work. Um, this is work that's done in a mid-century modernist suburb south of um, uh, San Francisco. Uh, there's a song 
um, which some of you may have heard called Little Boxes. It was a protest song in the 60s. Um, it was then, I think, made the theme song for Weeds. Uh, in any case, I discovered that this particular suburb, which is known as Westlake, uh, is the suburb um, that Little Boxes uh, was written about. And so my project in Little Boxes um, is to capture these little boxes in a very sort of, um, let's say, disciplined technical way. My camera's always as close as I can get it in exactly the same place in front of each of these images. Um, and the idea is to produce uh, a catalog um, similar, you know, I mean, obviously directly inspired uh, by the work of, of the Beckers, uh, to some extent, maybe a little bit by Edmund Shea, although my work is a little bit more sort of technically, um, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, strict, I would say. Ruscha is, is, is a lot looser. Uh, so in any case, these are just some, some uh, uh, excerpts from Little Boxes. Uh, in any case, let me get back um, now uh, to some of the theory, um, and then uh, we can wrap up and ask for questions. Okay, so cool. So I've been going for about 45 minutes, which is about right. Um, so let's get back to the theory a little bit. Um, why is it that we need camera movements? Um, what is it that the movements and the camera really give us? Well, it's really actually very, very simple. I, went, I talked about it before. Um, when we tilt um, the camera up, um, which we need to do frequently if we're shooting an object that needs to be captured fully in the frame, if the camera is tilted up, um, we will introduce uh, perspectival distortion. Um, if the camera is not tilted up, uh, so the, the image on the left is obviously a diagram of how a camera will capture an object tilting up. You'll notice that we can see the entire object uh, but that there will be a kind of keystoning or perspectival distortion. On the right, you'll notice the camera is level, but you also notice this little corner um, uh, to the upper left-hand corner that is no longer in the shot. So what actually happens? Camera tilted up, we no longer have um, a perfect one-point perspective. Um, camera level, we no longer have the composition that we want, right? So leveling the camera corrects the distortion, but alters the composition. So the simple um, beauty of the tech camera system, and here's the same thing incidentally uh, for a, a two-point perspective. Um, so the simple you know, truth of the, of the, uh, of the uh, tech camera system, uh, the reason that it's useful to me primarily um, is, um, is why, uh, you know, is, is the fact that we can basically use movements to recompose, and that's about it. Um, what does it mean to recompose? Well, Arnab showed you that we can slide um, the back of the image surface relative to the lens. Um, and this is just a little uh, diagram of what this actually means sort of technically, just so you can kind of understand it. And this will also give you the ability, I think if you understand this diagram, this will um, give you an ability um, to be, I would say, um, uh, an informed uh, and technically savvy um, consumer stroke decision maker for your own system. Um, and I'm going to point you also to information sources um, that have been provided by, um, uh, by DT. Um, and uh, you know, particularly, I want to just shout out you know, the incredible work of uh, Doug Peterson uh, and his team, um, who are just you know, incredible, who I've known for many years. We're good friends and have provided like, invaluable support over the years. So in any case, uh, this diagram kind of says uh, a lot. Um, if you imagine um, the, uh, the, the, this image that's captured by lens, the entirety of that image, um, we can call that the image circle, uh, okay? Uh, and the image that's captured um, is a subset of that image circle, right? Um, and so if you look on the left with no shift, you can see that the image circle, the, the, the image um, is in the middle of uh, the image circle. In other words, the frame is in the middle of the image circle. The beautiful thing about the image circle is that you, you have picture, you have the ability to capture image there. But what you need to be able to do is shift this little blue and green uh, square up or down. Um, and that is the virtue of movements. In other words, when you shift the back, you're actually recomposing um, uh, the, the image. So this is, I, I hope that this is clear. This is basically a diagram about what does it mean to recompose a scene with lens movement. And lens movement, you know, strictly speaking, is actually back movement. Because if you remember what Arnab showed, the lens is staying in the same place, the back is shifting. So the, the square, or, the, or let's say the, the sensitive surface of the film is actually moving within the image plane, right? Um, so here is some information that I've sort of captured from online. It gives you a little bit of a sense of how much image 
we have to play with um, for different lenses, okay? Uh, so for example, the lenses that, um, when I made this at the time were available um, for the XT system, and please uh, guys correct me if I'm wrong because I believe you've introduced some new ones, um, the Rodenstock 23, the 32, um, and I believe there was a 70. Um, the image circles are, 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 are different. So in other words, you have a greater or lesser degree of, of possible recomposition uh, depending on the focal length of the lens. So obviously in a very, very uh, wide lens, like a 23, you don't really need that much recomposition uh, because the lens itself is so wide. Uh, but when you get to the 70, um, the Rodenstock 70, for example, you have 100, um, uh, you have 100 millimeters of possible recomposition, uh, which gives you an awful lot of flexibility. Um, uh, it's good both for recomposition and also for stitching, if you're somebody who stitches. I don't do much stitching myself. Um, I wanted just to, to point you guys to and show you how to use and understand um, the, uh, the lens visualizer uh, which um, uh, DT has, has produced. Um, this is an online tool which is um, super useful uh, and super interesting, I find, um, uh, for understanding the technical performance of the system. Um, so you'll notice um, on the left you have a variety of lenses uh, with the parameters of the lenses. Um, and you notice on the right, you have the ability to um, understand different sensor sizes, right? So you can imagine um, a lens circle, uh, you can experiment with the different relative sizes of a sensor and lens to understand how much potential movement you have. So for example, um, we'll notice, I'll go back and forth. So here's the 28, you notice you don't really have, uh, 23, excuse me, you notice you don't have a lot of movement there. That orange um, square can't really be moved that much move to the 32 and suddenly we do have a movement. And I would say, you know, the 32 is a fantastic lens. It has some degree of, I'd love to have a conversation and use that lens. I find it has some degree of distortion, but it's, a, it's an amazing lens. And you do get, you know, pretty good movement with the 32. It's one of my sort of go-to lenses. Um, and this, uh, right now I'm, I'm assuming um, the 150, which is the largest sensor size. Obviously, if we were using um, smaller sensor back, we would have that much more movement. Um, so here's the 32, um, here's the 70, which suddenly you realize you have, um, uh, you know, just comparatively that much more movement. Um, uh, and so you can get a sense by playing with this tool uh, of the different possibilities uh, of what you can actually do. Um, uh, I am a big fan, a big fan of the Schneider 60 XL. Unfortunately, uh, there is not a lens profile in Capture One. I would love it if they made that one. Uh, but the 60, which is not sort of produced anymore, is a super sharp lens that has an amazing image circle. Um, so for me, I would say the majority of the work, a lot of the work that you saw from um, uh, Bombay Beach um, uh, is, um, is made with the this, this 60. Um, I also happened on a 70, so I use that one as well. And the virtue there we'll talk about is software. It's all built in in the 70. Um, so in any case, you know, here we can see if you have the 120, um, uh, which I also happen to use, an amazing lens for stitching because you can see the huge, huge image circle that it has. That basically means that this lens can be used, um, I mean, tactically for stitching, you can capture um, uh, an image of just you know, extraordinary resolution. This, um, again, uh, orange square is the 150 megapixel uh, image. So I've never done the calculations, but I mean, probably Doug or Lance or Arnab or somebody knows the maximum optic size you can get through stitch with the 120. Um, uh, in any case, um, just so you understand, actually, um, I've experimented with other lenses on the um, 150 system. Um, uh, interestingly, um, the, uh, comparing the Canon 90 millimeter tilt shift, it actually works on the 150 with a certain um, amount of uh, movement. Um, you actually can't get close focus on that, uh, but you can get infinity focus and you get some movement. So. If you happen to be, you know, working in a system where you might have the 90 tilt shift with you, um, I do for certain circumstances uh, still use my um, uh, my Sony for uh, for particularly for let's say uh, preliminary work before I do the finals. Um, you know, you can you can you can use that lens, and it's it's actually it's actually uh, perfectly useful. Um, although the, obviously the 90 HR lens is gives you that much more uh, flexibility. Um, you can also sort of notice just uh, out of curiosity, so you understand. Um, this is just a comparison of the different sensor sizes uh, relative to uh, one lens choice 
which is the Canon 90 millimeter. So you can see with a smaller, you know, um, uh, Sony sensor size, you obviously get that much more movement because the sensor is that much smaller. Um, so um, in any case, uh, that is kind of an ex just kind of a, uh, a description of everything you can do with this lens visualizer tool, which is, I would say, if you're going to decide for yourself technically um, what you need in the system, uh, this is a great place to start. And obviously, with the support of, of, of Lance uh, and Doug and Arnab and everybody at DT, they will give you um, a lot of advice about how this all works. Um, finally, just a few things, and I'm coming to quickly wrap up. Um, uh, I'm, this uh, seminar is not so much about uh, software correction, but I do want to do one thing. Um, you know, we do have tools that are built in. Um, in Lightroom, we have um, automatic sort of keystoning correction, which is very, very useful. Um, I do use this from time to time, although my workflow is, is not in Lightroom anymore. My workflow is, is pretty much um, entirely uh, in Capture One uh, with some touch-ups in uh, Photoshop after the fact. Um, but Capture One, and this is an important thing to point out, perhaps um, Lance or can jump in. Um, this is, again, one of the um, incredible things about the XT. Um, there is communication between the camera back um, and the lens. And so there's uh, an understanding, basically, of uh, the degree to which the lens is tilted. Now, I say it's important to not tilt your lens, but it's inevitable that there might be some small uh, tilts and whatnot. Um, these kind of corrections can be done um, automatically. Uh, so you have lens profiles, um, and you have uh, this is what I call positional intelligence. So this really allows you to squeeze, um, automatically squeeze, uh, really the maximum out of these lenses. So um, it's it's a really great it's a great system. Uh, finally, um, and these are my final thoughts, um, uh, random closing thoughts, uh, and then I'm going to wrap this and we can talk, um, and take questions or whatever. Um, uh, for those of you who use, um, since I moved to the 150, I have not used LCC corrections. Maybe I should be, but um, you know whether I'm shooting at night, um, uh, even you know uh, I don't. Again, I only use the the lens that I used to use LCC corrections on 32. I don't even really have to use those anymore. Um, uh, you know, perhaps I should be doing that, but I really haven't seen the need. Um, I have noticed that hot pixel correction um, is important, particularly for um, uh, long time exposures. But that's a trivial, simple. It's a one click adjustment in Capture One. Um, I do not stitch, uh, but tech cams. You know, given the fact that you get movement in the back, and you know, sort of no parallax, are great for that. Particularly with lenses like the 120, um, the HR32, uh, which is kind of a go to lens. Um, it's phenomenally sharp. Uh, the distortion can be challenging. Uh, so that's something that you know, we have to sort of deal with. Um, I've been surprised at how good the Canon tilt shift lenses perform uh, within their um, image circle limitations. So if you have them, they, you know, they, will, they can certainly be a supplement until you upgrade to um, their own stock lenses. Um, I love the HR70. Uh, it's got an amazing image circle. It's sharp. It's got a built-in uh, profile. As I say, I love my Schneider lenses. Love, love, love my Schneider 60. I really wish there was a profile for that. Um, I would just say workflow-wise, um, I'm not a kind of person who takes notes in the field. Um, I'm a hit and run kind of shooter to some extent. Um, and so uh, the XT does, you know, I've, I've, I haven't worked a lot with the XT, but I've worked somewhat. Um, uh, the XT does obviously give you all the information that you would have to ordinarily take notes for. And that really is, is, is great. Um, so yeah, to close out, you know, again, targets dictate tools, tools dictate moment, uh, movement. Um, if you can't get there, you can't make the picture. Uh, and uh, this, I really think, you know, is the system that gets you there. Movements, positional intelligence, leaf shutter, it's the future. Um, it's, it's not uh, to do a, a kind of a sales pitch for, um, for DT or phase one or Cambo. It is just something that I, I happen to believe. So anyway, um, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, uh, we're done and happy to take um, questions. Well, that was so, wonderful. Um, if everyone you know, wants to answer some, you know, ask some questions via the chat, we'll try and get to them. We'll spend a few more minutes here. I uh, just want to remind everyone that this has been recorded and you will be receiving a link so you can review it later as well. And that uh, us and the team at phase one are here for you. At okay. The webcam should be on. And uh, yeah, oh, uh, oops, nobody's sharing anything here. I might have to, I'm gonna do my, I'm gonna reboot.
He should be returning in one moment. Hello. Uh, when webcam should be on. There you go. Alan. Back. Okay, great. Um, okay, cool. Uh, yep, yeah, no, here, happy to answer questions. I mean, happy to, obviously, there are a lot of um, uh, experienced, um, you know, users. I'm also interested um, uh, in uh, what people think. I'm uh, looking at questions here. Um, yeah, a few things. Oh, the okay, the flat light. I'm just going to see them popping up. Yeah, so that was um, this is Jeffrey's question. Uh, yeah, I mean that was that was done deliberately. Um, uh, you know, San Francisco. Um, I have and, and that's thank you for pointing that out. There are actually two specific series um, within my work sub series. Uh, there are the kind of really diagrammatic um, images that I made deliberately on days when there were, you know, no clouds. Um, uh, and um, so there, so the, the, that those were, you know, kind of the flat light I love because it, it gave it the opportunity to, to kind of experiment with this kind of sense of flatness. You know, there are no directional shadows. And so in a sense, um, we're really perceiving the work, you know, the, the buildings as kind of facade. So that's what I was kind of fascinated by. And it just happened to be that there's a kind of another series of work uh, during the sunny days. Some of those I also like, so that's kind of a separate subseries. I haven't decided, when I've shown the work and I've exhibited it a couple of times, um, I usually show the work without, um, uh, without, the, uh, without the sun, without the sky, basically. Um, let's see. I see another question here. Thank you, Dominique. Um, do I ever use tilt? Um, I almost never do I have to say I do own um, my lenses are in cam uh, cambo tilt shift mounts um, you know I have it's, that's not entirely true um, tilt does come in handy if for example you're shooting a very long building um, and you need to um, equalize focus you know from the from the very beginning of the building to the very end of the building um, you, I wouldn't use tilt in that case. I would definitely use, you know, the shine fluke to tilt the plane of focus relative to the to the building. Um, I think I don't use tilt in a lot of my personal work because it's so much about flatness and facades. Um, I use tilt a lot. I mean, I I also in a completely different body of work. Um, I, I shoot a lot of uh, tabletop and close up stuff um, in my studio, um, and so in studio I. I of course, use tilt all the time uh, because it's absolutely necessary for that kind of work. Um, and also, these days, I use uh, more and more focus stacking. But that's um, you know a different a different kettle of fish. Uh, so let's see. Do I shoot tethered? That's a good question. Um, when I'm shooting um, a job, when I'm collaborating, um, I always shoot tethered uh, because that that's the only way, in my opinion, that I can have a conversation. A meaningful conversation with my client um, and and I'm very much when I'm working with a client about making the work collaborative uh, uh, when I'm shooting by myself um, I don't that much because I am someone who got used to shooting live view on you know cannons and whatnot so I feel you know especially now with the ability to kind of zoom in and the focus mask I don't need to tether um, on the other hand um, you know Nick Merrick, who's the quality of whose work is, you know, outstanding, um, unbelievable. Um, you know, he will never shoot without a tether, whether it's personal work, or whatever. Nick is very, very systematic in terms of what he does. And I've been to Cuba with Nick, shooting right next to him. Wherever we are, the laptop comes out um, and it's tethered, and he always works uh, from from that. So I think it really depends on. Um, how you prefer to work. In my case, I don't need to tether a lot of the time. Um, oh, uh, I'm just, again, I'm sort of seeing these things as they're popping up. Um, the electronic shutter. I mean, with tech cameras right now, um, uh, because I don't have the XP system yet, um, the majority of my work is done with the electronic shutter. Um, and I would say the electronic shutter is, is fine. Um, it's actually more than fine. It's it's amazing. Um, you know, it does obviously um, 
introduce potentially some artifacts, although I haven't really noticed much rolling shutter. Um, and I would probably and will um, go back to shooting with the leaf shutter when I have the option of shooting leaf shutter. I mean, I do occasionally still use, uh, and leaf shutter, of course, it's important if you're using, um, uh, if, you're, if you're shooting with, um, you know, artificial lights, so in particular, leaf shutter is super useful for that. Um, yeah, flash sync. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry to jump in here. If you are you looking at the questions tab? Oh no, I'm actually. I should really do look at the questions tab. Yeah, sorry. if you, I'm, uh, if okay. you do that, and okay, it by oldest. That way, we can get to the questions that folks have asked a while ago. That we can... oh, okay. I'm sorry. Pardon me. I'm, yeah, that's no, okay. no worries. Okay, quest, let me just let me just ask really quickly. Okay, uh, let's see. You mentioned leaf shutters, but I thought you found electronic and back more useful. Um, it does avoid vibration. I just kind of answered that question. Uh, do I ever? <coughs> excuse me. Do you ever shoot without a tripod? Um, uh, not with my tech cam. Uh, I've never done that. Um, I think one could, um, but uh, I couldn't. Uh, but, but I mean, I, I don't personally. Um, do I shoot with a, uh, I mean, I don't use shooting without a tripod to blur people. It's usually for me more uh, a choice of shutter speed. Um, uh, and let's see, other questions. Um, have I been using the IQ, uh, the IQ for double shot feature? Um, I have actually been incredibly impressed with the dynamic range of the images as single exposures. Um, that said, I, I have been experimenting with the double shot, multiple shot feature. Um, I have a whole body of stuff that I, I shot last summer. Honestly, I just haven't really gotten to the processing. So I, for me personally, the jury is out. Um, those features look amazing. Um, it looks like I'm going to be able to do amazing work with those, but I have not yet come to any verdict for myself. Uh, let's see. How restrictive is the 12 millimeter shift? I sort of um, answered that before. Um, I think that for 95% of the work, 98% um, of the work, the 12 millimeter shift is fine. It obviously depends on the lens that you're using. If you're using a very wide lens, you know, you don't get the shift anyway. Um, there are certain situations, you know, if I was very close to something and I wanted to produce a kind of worm's eye perspective where I might need to go beyond the 12 millimeter, um, I would say that I would probably, I probably won't be selling um, my, uh, my current tech body because it's got something like 15 or 20 millimeters of shift on it. And so if I need it, um, I'll probably still have it. But I would say if I was looking to enter into a system, and I needed to decide whether it was more important to have positional intelligence, leaf shutter, um, and, uh, and basically uh, basically those two things. That to me would outweigh um, the uh, ability to have more than twelve millimeters. I jump in real quick. The um, sure the question about you know using your tilt swing lenses from your Cambo and then the XT. Just want to let everyone know that the XT uses the same lens mount panel that Adam's other Cambo system uses and all the legacy Cambo WRS systems use. So if in fact yeah. he wanted to use his 70 TS lens that has the copal shutter on it, he can mount that on the XT and use either the electronic shutter or the copal shutter. So you do have options. It just won't be oh, wow. digitally integrated. And I didn't. I didn't actually realize. I mean, that's a new one. I mean, last. I didn't. I knew that I could do that. And yes, it is true. So you can. You can actually, if you have those lenses, you have the ability to have tilt. I didn't realize that you can actually use the electronic shutter. Yeah, and it's well. also planned uh, end of second quarter sometime when they make the X shutter system available for third party tech cameras. Theoretically, you'll be able to take your lens that's mounted with the X shutter. So let's say you have the seventy millimeter in the X shutter, you'll be able to place that on theoretically on your cambo body and have a cable that goes to the iq4 if you wanted more movements than 12 millimeters uh, you wouldn't get it recorded but you would still have compatibility and the ability to use extended movements if needed interesting oh that's actually that's super interesting so yeah there may still be a market for these uh let's call them um uh dumb but but wide tech bodies you know, outside of the XT. But I have to say, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do, when I, when I think about my own personal work and I was thinking a lot about this, you know, a lens like the 50 uh, with 12 millimeters is, is going to probably give me, 
you know, the vast majority of what I personally need. Just announced two weeks ago that will be released next month on the XP. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, okay, I have one question here. What system do I currently use um, at the beginning? Um, I use um, uh, the 150 back. Um, I use uh, the Cambo, um, I forget, what is it called, the, the body that I have now, Lance? 100. Yeah, the 1600, which is beautiful, um, and it has a very cool feature that allows you to, um, you know, uh, reorient um, uh, the back from uh, landscape to, uh, to portrait, uh, which is very, very nice. Um, and it's, you know, got, um, you know, the X and Y movements in the back, which are which are great. Um, Lens-wise, um, I have a bunch of lenses. I have a 32, which is the widest one that I have. I have a Schneider 60. I've got a Rodenstock um, 70, uh, and I actually have a Schneider 120. That's the with the one with the extender on the back. So that's my my system. Um, and as I say, I've also experimented with using. Um, yeah, I also have all the Canon tilt shift lenses, so I have experimented with those. And found them remarkably useful within their inner circle limitations. So, any other any other questions? I don't see anything marked. Now. I, I think we covered it all, and uh, I just would like to thank awesome. thank everyone for coming. Adam, thank you so much for the excellent presentation, and um, we'll be sending everyone a link again so you can watch it again at your own leisure or share it with others. And April eighth. Okay is Jeffrey Totaro's presentation, which will be on his architectural photography workflow through Capture One. So that'll be a nice workflow type of webinar. We also have a few others scheduled in between. Please check out the schedule on our website. And the link is in the chat area as well. Again, thank you and uh, have a good Great. day. And be safe, everyone. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Be well. Bye-bye.